Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response. Session 70 in our series began just almost three years ago now. We've we've been doing these basically every other week since since the pandemic started. And so it's great to have uh, have you back and we are getting underway. Uh, let, I need screen sharing, please. <clears throat> And so we are, uh, we're very happy to have, uh, have two outstanding speakers with us today who will help us understand the issues of having a seat at the broadband planning table, uh, March 2nd, 2023. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. We're an open consortium of libraries doing interesting things with technology. Uh, uh, we are, our sessions are hosted by our longtime partner, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, based in The Hague, IFLA, with Stephen Weiber, the head of uh, public policy for IFLA uh, at the controls, hosting and recording. Our media sponsor is Broadband Breakfast. They've been helpful with us. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the strategies, uh, the rationale for uh, having a, a seat at the broadband table because there's so much planning going on right now related to these federal programs. We've got two excellent speakers today, Doug Dawson, of, uh, the author of Pots and Pans, a daily blog that I recommend to everybody, and John Windhausen, the executive director of the Shelby Coalition, which is the leading anchor organization, organization of anchor institutions for broadband. Uh, our, our main focus on these, or one of our main primary focuses on, on connectivity has been on this dual use aspect to of course extend and enhance connectivity in the community, but also to increase resilience, to use the same technology to increase the, the, uh, the robust capability of, of libraries to support their communities in times of crisis, especially in uh, extreme weather disasters, which are, of course, are increasing. We've talked about it a lot. Uh, we basically believe that everybody should be close to a sign like this, uh, you know, within walking distance of, a, of an access point, uh, you know, a public park or a uh, here's a, a project in uh, uh, in Georgia. They're repurposing old phone booths to put these library access stations out around the community. Everybody should have something like this. You know, if they have nothing else, or if if they have a, a you know an outage, they run out of power. There's an outage, or, from some reason they need a backup, and so that should be a kind of a standard public service. Even better if they're staffed. Uh, but then there's also this response aspect of it, uh, the, the, the climate crisis. Uh, major climate changes are inevitable and irreversible. This is the hard news that we're, uh, some of us are denying, <laughs> not rationally, uh, but maybe we're not really embracing this reality as, as much as we should. And that's what we've been talking about is libraries sort of like it or not, people are gonna show up at your door when, when the proverbial goes down and they have nowhere else. They'll just think of the library. Well, yeah, it's the place to go. How do we, you know, find out what's going on, and how do we charge our, you know, our devices? So, accepting that reality and preparing for it is, is what we've been talking about. These, these, this, this looks like it's all happening at once, and of course, it happens in different places at different times, but increasingly in more places in more times, and it's just increasing, and it's just going to get worse. I mean, I guess you can deny that. What people are relying on, what they want is basically library Wi-Fi. I mean, they want the services behind that. Well, one of those is the open internet, but there's all the library digital services that, that people value. But that's how most people get to those services is through library Wi-Fi. And the ability to extend that further out into the community for different reasons is a super valuable uh, uh, capability and service. This is one uh, a project we were doing where the uh, the uh, a fixed remote access point was redeployed as a testing site at the dawn of the pandemic to, for a pop-up testing clinic. And, and of course, there are a lot of resources to help that kind of planning. This is a good one from ALA. So uh, 
Today, which is what we're really here for, is Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, $65 billion. So um, they it requires action plans at the state level. The money's flowing through the states, and the states are obligated to create these coherent, effective plans. And collaborating with stakeholders is a natural tendency, but sometimes they don't, you know, what we found is libraries are usually thought of, you know, oh, yeah, let's not forget the library. But it's rarely the place that policymakers go first uh, for most anything because libraries do so many things secondarily. I mean, they're the primary source of books and also, I would say, the primary source of no fee uh, Internet access. Tens of millions of people rely on libraries. Tens of millions of people in the U.S., over 14, rely on libraries for, for Internet access. Most of those have other sources, but they still go to the library for one reason or another. So this is this is what's happening. This is what we're going to talk about today. And um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to read this because this is what uh, uh, Doug Dawson has provided for us, that librarians have, have the best pulse on broadband. And this is this is absolutely the case. I mean, who who knows how it is to interact with uh, broadband more than libraries who have all these people coming in asking for support, direction, and service. And the state offices are going to be uh, doing the actual fund awarding of these grants uh, once their plan is in place uh, under the federal requirements. So this is the point, the vector for uh, planning is right at the state level. We encourage all, especially the SLAs, the state library agencies, to engage directly in this planning process and assert uh, the the value and the importance of libraries in these decisions and in these plans. This that's the principal area, but this this advocacy works at at really any level. Uh, that uh, you know local levels and state levels where libraries really need to uh, make make the uh, make the call. So uh, I, our. our our speaker is finding trouble getting onto the to the session. So um, what we're going to do here is, uh, John, I'm going to ask you to go first and introduce yourself and talk a little bit about Shelby, and we're trying to get Doug uh, connected. All right. Well, thank you, John Windhausen, uh, Executive Director of the Schools Health Libraries Broadband Coalition, acting today as our respondent. And uh, John is a longtime library advocate. Uh, He's, he's done work in his prior incarnation on behalf of ALA and others. He served time at the FCC, and we owe John a, a deep debt of gratitude for his work on putting together the original E-rate program, the now four-plus billion dollar program that connects uh, schools and libraries, uh, without which it's hard to imagine what it would look like. There'd be a lot of hats out holding, you know, trying to raise money to get basic connections. But uh, E-Rate has made a huge difference in, in universal service in general. Uh, I don't want to uh, tell the whole uh, Shelby story, John, but you're welcome to, and we'll see if we can get uh, Doug going. Let me stop share and turn it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Don. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, just a, a quick additional note about the Shelby Coalition. As Don said, uh, we're a public interest group based in Washington, D.C. We now have about 330 members uh, of our Shelby Coalition, so we've been growing. When, when Don Means was our first inaugural chairman of the board of the Shelby Coalition, uh, I think we had about 50 members at that time. So we've been growing and it's largely because we're focused on trying to connect not just the anchor institutions and libraries but also the surrounding community we believe everybody should have a high quality affordable broadband connection but oftentimes libraries can be the best way to get that connection uh, an affordable high capacity connection uh, into each community so i'll start by agreeing uh, and with exactly what doug dawson's quotes uh, say uh, that, that Don, you read, now is the time for libraries to get together with their state broadband offices. Um, <clears throat> now, a, a year or two ago, not every state had a broadband office. 
But because of that massive $65 billion in broadband funding that was passed by Congress a year and a half ago, now every state, every state has signed up to participate in this broadband program. And they've also, every state has created their own state broadband office. Um, and not just the states, also the territories as well. So this is an important time because the state broadband offices are going to have the most direct say over how that $65 billion gets spent. They are in, in the driver's seat. Now they are going to be, um, uh, there is going to be quite a bit of oversight of the state activities by NTIA in the US Department of Commerce. So the money goes first to NTIA and then NTIA allocates it for each state. But then the states will be deciding who gets that money and how to, to enforce it. So the, the uh, plan right now is for each state to develop their own state broadband plan. So they have to develop this plan and get it approved by NTIA, and then they can allocate the money. So probably the state broadband plans are being developed this year in 2023, and then the money will be actually awarded according to that plan in 2024. But that's why this is the critical time period, because the states are putting these plans together. Um, and I'll just share an anecdote. Oh, and I see Doug has, uh, has joined us. So I'll finish with this, share this anecdote, and then I'll turn it back to Doug. Uh, but I had a chance to talk to the state broadband official in Louisiana. Uh, his first name is Vineeth, and I can't pronounce his last name, so I'll just have to leave it at Vineeth. But he shared a very interesting story because he at the Louisiana State Broadband Office said that he is traveling around the state, meeting with each community to talk about how this broadband uh, money is going to be awarded and it could improve their community. So they're driving three or four, five hours each way. To, and when they get to their, these small rural communities, they're meeting with the schools and they're meeting with the libraries and they're meeting with the fire departments and they're meeting with the public safety officials. And the point is that they are trying to tell their story about how broadband can be transformative for these communities. But there's a bit of a, a problem because the FCC's national broadband map at present does not include libraries. It assumes that libraries already have broadband service. And that is not the case. They, don't, they may have a minimal amount of broadband, but the IIJA Act passed by Congress calls for libraries and other anchors to have gigabit capacity. But unfortunately, the FCC's map largely ignores libraries. And let's face it, if you're not on the map, you're not gonna get the broadband invested uh, and the broadband upgrades that the act uh, calls for. So we're very disappointed with the FCC map so far uh, we're trying to get that changed, but wouldn't it be ironic if Venice and these state broadband officials talk about the benefits of broadband for libraries, but then don't actually connect to the libraries with those grants? That would be a severe disconnect. So that's why uh, I'm just going to second Doug's call for libraries to be in touch with their state broadband offices now to make those connections, help the states understand how critically important it is for the states as they're developing their own broadband map to make sure the libraries are on that map and that state maps could be better than the FCC maps. So with that done, I'll, I'll pause and let uh, Doug Very and then good. I'll come back to respond. Very good, John. I mean, uh, more than ironic uh, to exclude the libraries would be tragic. And there's no question that there are thousands of libraries that lack broadband, lack like what we call consumer level broadband, you know, 25 megabits, not the 100, even 100 megabits that the, that the FCC has been tossing around as the new standard. There are, you know, there are a lot of libraries out there that maybe have less than 10 megabit connections. And so it just, it's completely unnecessary for uh, these communities. So Doug, welcome. Sorry for the uh, link snafu, but you made it. That's the main thing we've been talking about you uh, behind your back, but now that you're here, uh, I'll talk a little about you a little bit in, in your presence. And I was introducing you uh, and, and your daily blog of pots and pans as a as a as a as a, as a gem of information and insight. And how you generate that every single day just boggles my mind. 
but uh, you do somehow, and it's great. I know you have a lot of experience to draw on. That's that helps, but it's it's a great resource. I advocate uh, everybody consider uh, it, subscribing to it. And uh, today is a great example. You know, you wrote up peering, which is you know not something most people pay much attention to, but actually it's really very important how that happens. And and you point out that. Uh, that the uh, the RENs, the, the state r &E networks that uh, subscribe to Internet 2, this big national backbone, connect uh, to each other and, and bypass the open Internet. And that's part of the services that they provide, but only, which is important as it translates into response time, lower response time, and also a level of security that, that you don't get with uh, these uh, chains of, uh, of intermediate uh, carriers. I just thought it was really fascinating. It's a great, you know, story that people should know about people that are involved in, in working on policy and broadband. So welcome, Doug. And uh, please, we've we've quoted you. We've shown the quotes that you submitted. Your and, and John has just echoed them. So you're set up. So tell us how to do it. Tell us why and how. Very good. Well, first off, I'm gonna I'm going to. Uh agree with everything John said. It's a, it's a travesty that libraries are not on the map. That was one of the items I was going to mention today, and and, it, and I'll just talk about everything else. But it, it's crazy. It doesn't make sense. Um, first off, I love librarians. I mean, I think you guys are the heart of most communities, especially rural communities. Uh, we're a consulting company for broadband, uh, and we work with mostly rural communities, even though we work with quite a few cities as well. And And what we find... One of the things we do as part of those studies is we do interviews and, and we always interview librarians. And so I've talked to those librarians in rural libraries who don't even have any broadband at all. I mean, you know, we, I hear these folks story. And so you're absolutely right that, that some libraries are completely left behind here. Uh, but in doing that, what I've learned over the years, I mean, just in the last year alone, I would imagine we've probably interviewed 150 to 200 librarians. I mean, we really talk to, to your folks often all over the country. And, and these are in-depth, at least half our interviews. So we get to know what they're really doing. And what we see is librarians everywhere do a completely, you know, wide range of different things. For example, I think that, you know, your folks know more than anybody else. The NTIA just came out and said that 90% of homes now have broadband. That means 10% don't. And they either can't get it where they live, where they can't afford it. And and the librarians know who those folks are because that's who comes in and talks to them. And, and so, you know, you have a better pulse on who those folks are at the national level. They don't have a clue about who doesn't, isn't on the internet. You know, you also know how, you know, librarians know how people struggle with digital literacy and even just regular literacy, that that's a real barrier for a lot of folks to get on the internet. They come to the library and use the computers there and, and, librarians step in and help them, which is one of the most wonderful functions you guys do. You know, they know how badly people want broadband. One of the stories was just from a month ago, and I was talking to the library, and, and well, actually, this story came from a year ago, so this was, I confused my stories, but this was still during the pandemic, and as I was talking to her, she almost was in tears because she was not allowed during the pandemic to open the doors and let students in. And there were a dozen students sitting at picnic tables in the heavy snow and blowing wind doing their homework during the day, that very same day that I was talking to her. And she was just distraught over this, that she just couldn't let them in the door. She was, look, how could, uh, I, I'd love to let them in and I go away if that's what the issue is. <laughs> you know, it was it's crazy. And so librarians really helped the world through the pandemic. And, and I mean, you guys really know how badly people need broadband. You also know what you really know what people want to do on the broadband. You know when folks come in what they're trying to get done. They're trying to get to a government agency or they're trying to do their number one hobby. They're trying to connect with family or whatever. Everyone who comes has a different agenda, right? You know more than any policymakers, librarians do, what people are really trying to get done on the internet. And again, finally, you know, you know the trouble people have navigating computers and and just everything to do with that. Once they get on the internet, they're trouble of navigating the internet. And so because of that, I think that librarians have the best pause on that 10%. I mean, you, you know what the people who don't have internet need. And that's why I think that you need to be heard. 
Uh, and so we'll talk today about the ways you can get that done. And there's two chances to get heard. Uh, first is there's this gigantic $42.5 billion beak cram program. And that's exactly the one John was talking about. The, the, the state broadband offices, that money's all going through states and the state broadband offices are required. The quote in the congressional legislation is, talk to folks, I didn't use the word folks, that's me in North Carolina, but talk to folks in every corner of the state. And that's what they're really doing. They're going to small communities, large communities, anybody can ask to be spoken to. The five libraries want to get together and have them just talk to those five, you're allowed to ask for it. They have to talk to anybody who asks to have a conversation with them. And so they're traveling out to these communities. And so, the, you know, and so, and, and the way that grant works, and here's where it's important that the libraries talk. First off, those grants are largely to, to fill the gaps of unserved and underserved people. And that's mostly rural. And so all the, you know, so the rural libraries certainly have a real big, you know, reason to, to make sure that their area gets served. But that's not all the grants do. Those big grants also then, if there's money left over in states, and a lot of states we think there will be after they serve the rural areas, those, that money can be used for cities. Very specifically, the, the rules spell out it could be used for low-income public housing. Again, a very, very unserved population in most places. It also, this is the most interesting one that you're just going to almost laugh at or if you don't cry about it. It actually says the grants can be used for anchor institutions, but they tend to put you on the map. <laughs> So you could actually ask for a grant just to bring broadband to inst anchor institutions. I mean, that's an allowable request of a grant, uh, but then I don't know how you prove that you need it because you're not on the map, right? But that's an actual, there's only four listed ways that you can use money, that's the third one. The last one that it mentions is uh, that it can be used to serve small pockets of people. That one's very important too, because, you know, we know in my own city, I live in Asheville, North Carolina, when the new broadband map came out, of course, I poured all over the city just to see what the heck was here. I found 20 different little pockets of two, three, four, five, ten 10 homes who had said didn't have broadband. And, and I thought that was kind of extraordinary since charter supposedly serves everybody here. But one of those pockets was on a route that I walk by all the time. So the next time I walked by there, I saw a guy in the yard and I go, is it true you don't have broadband? Boy, did I ever open up the floodgates of that story. <laughs> but he's in the middle of a city downtown and his little community of about five homes there, the cable company never built there and he doesn't have DSL for whatever reason anymore because you know the DSL many places has been sort of turned off. AT&T is the telephone company here and they're very quietly yanking copper dead. And so, and so you know, he says, yeah, I'd, he, I don't have broadband. We have to, you know, we have to use our cell phone. I'm in the mountains here. There is no WISPs. There's none of those kind of normal alternatives you get. You can't use the satellites here. I mean, we live on steep hills with all trees. This is a terrible place for, for Starlink. And so he didn't, they, he, his folks didn't really have any opportunity. And these grants can be used for somebody to go in and serve them, you know, but, that, but somebody has to want to do that. And so, you know, so that's who needs to be served. And I think that Libraries know these folks. I guarantee you the librarians in Asheville know about these folks who don't have broadband at their house because that, that's where they go to get it done, right? The other grant that's even probably way more down your alley is a 2.75 billion grant for it's called digital, digital equity grants. And there's actually two separate programs. One is, is gonna be administered by the state for 1.44 billion. The other one is directly from the NTIA. 1.25 and that adds up to the 275. And this can be used for basically they're called digital equity. It can be used for computers and devices. It can be used to, to help train people how to use computers. It can be used for workforce development. It can be used for such things as, as helping your community understand things like internet safety and, and, and you know, security and all those sort of things. So there's a long list of ways it can be used. And the, re and the reason for the two grant programs, I don't know why they split it into, but typically NTI is gonna give out the giant grants. They're probably gonna give it to nationwide foundations who serve 10 states and, and those sort of things. But at a state level, they could give a grant to one library. So you all need to know about these to consider going after them. But what's most interesting about those two grant programs is exactly what John mentioned. The, the, for the first time of any grant I've ever seen in my life, 
the, the states are required to go out and talk to people. So they have to talk to people about the digital equity grants too. And they, some states are doing that in the same conversation. They're talking about both. And some are making two different sets of trips around the state. And so this is very much a local issue for most folks. And so you should do exactly what John had suggested. If they're coming to your community, the librarian better be there. They can get your points made. You know, they want to hear from what's going on. But you also, if you have a state library association or even just 10 libraries want to get together, you can ask for the same audience and just talk about libraries. They will absolutely require to talk to you. Not only that, but when they talk to you, they have to write down all the questions you ask and they have to give you a written response if they don't answer them in the meeting. And they have to send all of those questions and answers to the NTIA and explain how they, how they satisfied your question. I mean, they're on the hook to truly communicate with you. And so, and they're trying, they're trying very hard. These, I don't know how to answer, I don't know how to say his name either, John, his last name. <laughs> uh, but they're required to go out and have these, they're, they're calling them listening sessions. Every state has a different name for how they're describing this, but it's not hard to find these. So, you, you know, if you go to your state broadband office website, it should describe the process. And, and you should either make sure that you go to the local ones or ask for the special ones just for libraries. I mean, this is a one-time chance to really have them hear you about broadband. Now, pardon me, it's the first day of allergy season in North Carolina. So. Now, if you go to these, they want to hear stories, but more important than stories is I think that if you go to these, you want to be armed with an agenda. You want to say, here's the two or three things I want you most to hear because <clears throat> they're really looking for folks to suggest solutions because the state broadband grant offices are in the process of writing a five-year broadband plan. And we want to make sure that the things that people want are in those plans. And so that's the real purpose of, of these listening sessions is to get that across. So anecdotes are nice, but also I think you want to come in and go, no matter what else you do, do A, B, and C. And every one of you will have a different list. In my community, you know, we need, we need outdoor Wi-Fi here because, because folks just, you know, they're just, they don't have broadband. You know, our library closes at five o'clock or at seven o'clock, but folks need to have public Wi-Fi. Could you help us give a grant for that? Whatever it is you're, you think your community needs, you know, you know, my library could do a whole lot more if I could get 20 computers in the basement. So, I mean, make a specific list of things that you would like to get. Not that they're going to give them straight to your ear, but you're planting the seed so that later on you can support grants that actually go after those specific things. They've now heard you talking about your community. So that, that's the first place that they have to listen to you. The next place is they're actually going to have to write a five-year plan. And so everybody gets a chance to review that five-year plan. So when it gets published, you can come back and go, you know, they didn't list my issues in here. And you can now make a formal response to that. Uh, because if, if, if your issues are not in that plan, it's not going to get addressed by that state. And so it's like, you guys didn't really talk about connecting rural libraries here in your plan. You know, we talked to you about that, but it's not in the plan. And, and I believe that... <laughs> they're going to be under pressure from the NTIA to actually probably come back and modify their plan if they get those kind of good comments. Uh, now, we all know that sometimes written government plans aren't worth the cost of the paper they're printed on. But at least we want to have our issues in the plan so we can say, hey, you've agreed that you're going to address this issue, right? If we're not in the plan at all, they're not going to address your issue. And so, so and again, your, list, your issue could be having to do with Wi-Fi, public housing, computers. I mean, whatever it is, you know, connecting more libraries, whatever your issues are, let's make sure that they get into those plans. Um, the third place that you're gonna have a chance to talk to them, and, and John had alluded to this, they're also going to have to go out and they're developing, each state is developing their own plans for how to deal with the broadband map. And the broadband map is simply a map that says, here's where we think everybody lives, and here's where we think people have and don't have broadband. And so, and so they're going to have to, there's a big, right now, a big federal push with federal government has, has published that list, and people can go in and try to get 
with whatever's in that map corrected on the federal map, but that doesn't have anything to do with the state grants. The state grant offices, the broadband offices are gonna have the ability to use something different than the federal map if they choose to do so. And so you need, we need to stress to the state broadband offices, in my county, you know, this federal map missed a third of the county. It says it's served. I can tell you it's not served. I know all the people that live there. Nobody has broadband. You know, when you go to give out grants here in this county, you know, please do not listen to that stupid federal map. You know, and, and the federal maps are very poor. They just came out for the very first draft. It's a brand new map. And of course, whenever you do something new, it's just not good. They might get good in three or four or five years, but this first one is not good. And so, but, and so we don't want all the mistakes in that map to, to not, to mean people don't get grants, you know, and to, and to show you how bad the maps are, I was working with a county in New Mexico, the city of, of, of Window Rock, which is the town right outside the Navajo Indian Reservation, wasn't on the map at all. The entire town was missing. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, how the heck did you miss that? Now there's been a second revision and now it's in there. But, but, there, but that's just a real small example of how poor these maps are. They, they just have, first off, there's an estimate they're missing 40 million homes. They clearly don't have the anchor institutions. They don't, not only libraries, they don't have schools, they don't have courthouses, they don't have city halls. They simply elected not to put those in there and, and we're all mystified by that. Why the FCC wouldn't think that it's important to put those in the map, especially since we know where every one of them is. You know where the libraries are is not a mystery. Nope. You know it's it's not like anybody had any trouble finding all your addresses, right? Uh, so so but but there's all sorts of just other errors, and then there's errors where the ISPs have claimed broadband speeds that don't really exist. And so they you know they're coming in and going, we're delivering 100 megabit broadband to this piece of the county, and and, and everyone who lives there goes, no, they're not. They're delivering three megabit broadband, or they're not even here at all. In many cases, the they're not even where they say that they're at. Um, a classic example, uh, as someone you, as some few of you may run across, Chris Mitchell, he lives in downtown uh, Minneapolis or St. Paul, and there's a wireless carrier that claimed they could deliver gigabit to his house. So he challenged it because they can't. First off, they don't. There's no such technology, and secondly, they're nowhere near him. And so, so he went through the FCC challenge. And so, but but if you're in a rural area, and of course. Downtown St. Paul was never going to get a grant, so it didn't have that much impact on the, these grants. But if you're in a rural area and an ISP did that, you very well might not get any money for these grants, and that area may not get their broadband solved. I mean, these grants, forty-two billion, is a one-time life, one once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because we've never had anywhere near that amount of grant money for broadband before. There's been all sorts of folks who have estimated what that means. About half of them are very optimistic and say that's more than we need, that that'll absolutely cover everybody. There's some other folks who go, that's kind of true, but these grants are given out by states and some states that's enough money, other states it's not. And then there's the pessimists who go, we think that's 20% short and we're not gonna find out till the grants are filed and we see what falls out. But hopefully the optimists or the middle people are way closer to the truth. And most, hopefully most rural folks We'll get, at least finally get a broadband solution. And in doing that, hopefully the libraries in the rural areas will get their broadband solution. Uh, so, you know, that'll be a big thing. But even after all that's done, the folks who can't afford broadband still are not going to be able to afford broadband. I mean, that's not going to really, all this money is not going to fix those folks whatsoever. You're probably all aware that there's a nationwide plan called the ACP that gives a $30 a month discount for qualified houses. And qualified houses are, there's like 10 ways to qualify, you know, and household who has income that's 200% or less of the poverty level and then participation and all sorts of things like school lunches and a whole bunch of other programs qualify you for it. But if, you, but if you're in a town where broadband costs $90, you still may not be able to afford it after the discount. That does not make it, it makes it less expensive. It doesn't make it affordable. There's a really big difference. There's far too many homes and you all, and librarians know this better than anybody, when you have to pick between broadband and getting food on the table, food's gonna win every time. So, and so you know, we have to still come up with affordability and, and these grants are not gonna cover that. 
hopefully that that second set of grants I talked to you about, the digital equity grants, can help with some of that. You know, at least, but, but it doesn't help to get computers into homes if they can't afford the monthly rate for the broadband. I mean, we still have a really big challenge to overcome here. Um, a lot of cities are working on plans that you might want to consider as part of your solutions is to provide free Wi-Fi, provide free low access, wireless access, so at least everybody has something. You know, let's, let, that's one possible thing to get behind is, you know, if, 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 I, if folks can't afford the $90 broadband from Comcast, let's at least get them 20 megabits on a wireless connection in their house because now they can use the internet. That, that's still inferior. You know, two of them can't get on and do a Zoom call at the same time but it's better than having zero broadband at their house. So, and so, you know, so there's just all sorts of ideas of ways that, that we can solve the digital divide. It doesn't have to be everybody gets fiber, even though that would obviously be ideal. Um, but, you know, to, I mean, to summarize all this, I, you know, there is a really very short window, next three, four, five months for you to truly get heard and so th this is not an issue to go talk about for three months and go, let's think about how we can get heard because you may have missed your opportunity. These meetings are going on now. There's going to be a very, you know, there might be a 60 or 90 day time period when they publish their five-year plan for you to react. And so you just sort of have to get tied in to what each state is doing. And then if you want to be heard, do it on their timeline. Um, it's, there's still time at every state to get on their schedule to be heard. Those are still ongoing now. Um, on top of being a consultant, I also am the president of a nonprofit in North Carolina. And we our number one focus is broadband, which probably doesn't shock you. And, and so we're going to have a session with them, just us. I mean, every, anybody can ask for one. And so just, you know, ask them to, to come and talk to you. And, and they don't have to drive out. They don't have to make the five-hour drive. You can agree to talk to them online like this. So, so it's not, it doesn't have to be that that big of a painful experience to if they you know they might have trouble fitting another drive into their schedule but they certainly can fit an hour or two into their schedule for you so uh so you know so you know that's my message to you i believe librarians know what the community needs almost more than anybody else the, the uh you know the only other folks who have anywhere similar knowledge would be you know the social welfare folks and your folks who run the various programs, they know all the same stories. But what they don't know, that librarians know, is you actually help people every day actually get on the internet and do things on the internet. That's, that's a knowledge nobody else has. You know in your community, here's, and communities differ vastly. If you look at the same demographics, average incomes, percentage of people in poverty, you will see the, you know, two different communities have a completely different experience at the library and what folks are coming in and asking for. Um, you know, it, and I'm sure you all hear these stories, but I was just working with a county in, in, uh, in north of Missouri and about 50% of the people in that county were like, I don't need no broadband. And they really, and that's exactly how they all told us. <laughs> you go to, we went to a county, two counties away, and they're like, oh man, we need broadband. Everybody told us that. So the county's, Communities differ a lot, but, but in both of those counties, there were still a lot of people who used the libraries and still needed the broadband solution. So, uh, so you know, it's, you know, you know, your, you know, which of those counties you are, and you know what your folks need. And and I really highly recommend that that you get involved because, again, you can get involved. This group here could have meetings at various states. Anybody has to be heard as long as one of you is in that state. I mean, you're allowed to do that, I believe. So, um, and so, you know, this group should come up with your list of things you most care about and maybe disseminate it to all the librarians everywhere and go get in there and talk. Um, you know, the, those conversations may lead to the grants that lead to the solutions. And if you're not heard, they won't do that. So, so that's my speech basically. So, I, I know we wanted to have a question and answer session and chat some more here. So, that's great, Doug. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. You really have laid it out well and uh, uh, and appreciate the uh, the timeline part of it. So that is a, a workable window to engage, I guess, prior to the publishing of the tentative plans and then after that to respond to the plan. So uh, two two opportunities and 
uh, I think especially an opportunity for the state library agencies yes. to convene those, to have their own, they should already have, have their own they, meeting. They yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a, it's an amazing point that, that, that the anchor institutions are, are not on the maps. I mean, there's a database of every library in the country. Of course and, there is. <laughs> just drop that in. You know, you do it in-, in On, on a, top of that, I'm pretty sure you could go to Google Maps and go put a dot on libraries that would do it. I don't think that this is a hard thing to do. Before we ask John to kind of come in and respond, is this mapping question, you know, how long have we been trying to do maps? And where do we go? Where does the FCC to go get information from maps? They go to the carriers. And so, great. So that's really smart to ask you know, for for privileged information that, you know, they don't want to give you. So they give you misleading information and there's no penalty for that. And and we just keep going around and around about this. It was Microsoft, not that, I believe it was last year, maybe the year before they came out and said, well, no, it's not 25 million people that don't have broadband. It's more like 125 million people don't have actual broadband. Well, right. wouldn't they know? Would, does it Netflix know? Don't, don't all these big? Yes, uh, they, they do know. And, and, know. and Microsoft is probably the one who knows more than anybody because the test of having good broadband is downloading your new Windows 11 upgrade. Right? Downloading your, your movie. And, and, if that, and, and if you're on really bad broadband, you might not even be able to get that done. So and, why or, it, or, or it takes you an hour. It's like, well, you know, and they have to try three times. They know exactly what people have. And what so they also know is the a other very time interesting... Time. They also know a very interesting fact. A lot of ISPs use something called burst. They give you fast broadband for three minutes and then they slow you down. So when you take a speed test, <clears throat> it says I have hundred megabits, but that's not your real speed. And unless you, if you do anything that takes more than three minutes, your real speed might be 10. And so, yeah. and so that Microsoft said, we pierce that veil. Here's what people are really doing at their houses. And when they said 125 million, that was over two years ago. And, and the number is probably down now because there has been quite a bit more broadband construction, but it's still a giant number. And so they, they know better than anybody and they don't have a seat at the table. They could have published, you know, they could put a dot on the map for every one of those places. They know exactly where they're at, so. So why haven't the other platform companies weighed in? Uh, you know, Facebook yeah. has information. Google has a ton of information. Why? Google, Google does it, absolutely because everyone it, who watches it, everyone it, who watches uh, you know uh, YouTube they absolutely know right. So it's in their interest to have people with better connections. Why aren't they at the forefront uh, of putting information out there? I think they're too busy fighting Congress to make sure that they don't lose their ability to do things on the internet. <laughs> okay, right. Every well, corporation has their own agenda. I've been asking this question for a couple of years now. So, yeah. okay, uh, John, please, thank you. Uh, uh, Doug covered a lot of ground. Uh, I hope you were taking notes. I know you have an amazing memory, but uh, whatever. Uh, please, come on. All right, well, I'm happy to. And um, I will say Doug and I have not worked together that much in the past, but boy, I agreed with everything he said. Um, th there are problems with the maps and they go beyond the anchor institutions not being on the map. There are whole communities being left out. Um, the, the basic uh, uh, broadband companies are exaggerating uh, their, their, their level of service that they can offer. Um, Don, you made reference to there's no penalties. Uh, that's uh, an open question. We just heard last week that uh, the FCC chairwoman Rosenworcel has launched some investigations of companies who have uh, allegedly uh, exaggerated or misrepresented the information about their broadband availability. So now those investigations will probably not be able to keep track of them because they're closed door proceedings. But, you know, at least the FCC seems to be aware of the problems. Um, but the point I wanted to come back to in particular is you may uh, be wondering, libraries may be wondering, well, states are supposed to uh, reach out to all the stakeholders, including us. So can libraries just sit back and wait for the state to come to them? You know, what's the problem? Why do we have to take this on? And I'd like to address that because libraries have a couple of things working against them. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the problems is that the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that creates the BEAD uh, broadband funding program 
lists four priorities in, of how the money is supposed to be spent. First priority is unserved households. Second priority is underserved households. Third are the anchor institutions. And then fourth for digital equity. So there is one line of uh, understanding, which I disagree with, but some people are saying, okay, well, all the money has to go to serve the unserved households first, and then the underserved households. And then if there's any money left over, connect the anchor institutions at the end of that process. That is not a good way to look at the legislation, but that is a line of argument that some of the broadband companies are taking because they are trying to drive that investment into the, the most rural areas and connecting focused on homes and the, 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 the primary uh, telcos and cable companies are not as focused on the anchor institutions. We suggest instead looking at it holistically because if you're building out a network to a rural market, it makes sense to connect to the anchor institutions at the same time that you're connecting the homes. And so we like to point out, and this is what I suggest libraries should point out to their state broadband directors, is that it doesn't make sense to build a network just to serve those outlying homes and then ignore the anchor institutions and the other li and the libraries that are in those communities. You ought to build a network that's going to be sustainable. And, it's, and the network is going to be much more sustainable if you connect the libraries and the other anchor institutions along with those homes in one network build. So that's my suggestion because the industry, as I mentioned, tends to ignore the anchor institutions. They divide the world between business and residential and leave the anchor institutions out of the mix. And that's, I think, unfortunately, what's crept into the national broadband map. That's what the FCC has defined the two categories as, broad, as residential or business. And it's grouped anchor institutions into the business category and it made the assumption that, oh, well, they're businesses they can purchase enterprise level services. Well, that is not true, especially of these rural libraries and small anchor institutions that are purchasing off the shelf broadband. They need help. They need to get higher broadband capacity. Uh, and the FCC's maps are just wrong on this point. So that's why it's so important for libraries to work with their states. Now, my understanding is maybe Doug, you can, you may have a better feel for this than I do, but my, my uh, best estimate is that about half of the states are doing their own broadband maps. And most of those states that are doing their maps are including the anchor institutions. But the other half of the states are not doing their own maps, and they're likely to rely on the FCC map. And so if the FCC map is the only thing they have to go with, then it leaves out the anchor institutions. That's where the risk is that the, those anchor institutions on in those states are not going to be connected. So that's why contacting your state representative and making the affirmative like outreach to them um, is so important for libraries to make that connection. Let me address a few things that you said there. One, you're going to not be shocked by this, but the map has also missed a lot of businesses. <laughs> it's just entire business communities. It's like, hey, we're here. And, and, and you know, the idea that businesses can afford, you know, expensive broadband is crazy. A lot of businesses barely can afford anything. They're struggle, right? And so, you know, especially rural businesses. So, so that's there. Yes, about half of the states have some, about a third of the states have pretty good broadband maps that they've spent many years developing. There's a bunch of others who probably get you up to the half, maybe even up to 60% are trying to do that right now. Uh, and so, but then there's at least a third, somewhere between a third and a half, who will have to rely on the FCC maps. And that's really going to be unfortunate because it's not there. Um, I also agree with your point. You know, the idea that you have to serve unserved and then anchor institutions do them in that order, that's simply an interpretation of the rules. The state broadband offices have the ability to decide how they think it should be done. And so that's why you want to get in here and have these conversations. Because you can say, hey, you know, we all need to get served. You know, we're not a special case. If anyone builds anywhere close to us, we have to be included in that. And so, and so you just want to, you know, it's that the carrier's interpretation is very selfish. Obviously, they're hoping two things. One is they would actually like to get the money and create rural monopolies because whoever builds fiber in a rural area is going to be the only ISP there for the next 40 years. 
but they're also trying to keep the money out of the cities where they're at. They don't want folks coming and bringing better broadband in a town where they're the ISP because that means that fiber could be used for other stuff too. So they, they're just trying, wherever they have a network, they want to try to keep this grant money out of it. That's, you know, it's very selfish, but there are businesses and that's what businesses do when you're big guys. So, um, so we have to counteract, you know, their, their poor social grace, if you want to put a word on it. Uh, so, you know, so that's, again, that's an extremely important issue to get across is don't let us out. And in fact, the next round of maps, how about you put us in there, you know? These grants are not going to be awarded probably until 2024. And so we still have time to get the libraries in the maps if somebody decides to put them there. As she said, the database exists. They could snap their finger and you're all in in 10 minutes. I know they have that file. And so it's a matter of wanting to put you in there. The maps are a very odd thing because the FCC hired a company to build the map and then that company decided what goes in and doesn't go in. And we don't understand how they got their data. It's not at all transparent. In fact, it's even worse than that. You can go to the national map and see what's in there for your community, but you can't get a file from them to actually do anything with that data unless you pay them a fee. <laughs> and so this, so this company is gonna make a fortune off of giving you access to the map. You could do it the hard way. You could go in and copy down what every house has, house by house. That's completely publicly available, but in mass, it's not publicly available to you. This company called CostQuest is, is making, it's probably planning to have $100 million revenue off of these maps. So, and so it's, you know, it's, not, it's not available to you or community to go in and say, here's what we think should be corrected unless you somehow get a hold of these maps. Now, a lot of counties and cities have gotten a hold of them, and I'm sure they would let you use that data. But you can only use that data to object to the maps. You can't use it for other things like planning. I mean, they, this whole thing is just a fiasco of FCC giving a license to a private company to control the maps and not giving that access to, to us, you know, the people in the real world. So that's one more giant fault of the maps. So that's another thing to complain about if you go to the meetings. Um, so yeah, I completely ag agree with you, John. So there's a whole lot of things to be unhappy with we have a chance to, to be heard, so. I'm, I'm glad you uh, introduced fiasco into the conversation there, Doug. Well, that's my polite word. <laughs> <laughs> what, what strikes me about all this is it feels like a massive backfill when we lost track and we've spent tens of billions of dollars and now decades doing what universal service would have dictated from the get-go. When the arrival of the web, when every, a new service, everybody got it. It was a requirement, not kind of letting the market decide where, you know, to invest because they're going to invest where they make money, which are the dense urban markets. And that's what they've proven again and again. And they're extremely talented at, at keeping it that way. So it's, it's galling uh, as a fiasco. So uh, Stephen Abram has his hand up. And thank you, Stephen, for... Uh, joining in, what what what's on your mind? What have you got to ask or say? <laughs> Th thanks for the the talk. I think it's excellent, and I worry uh, that uh, the tone uh, that uh, comes from this is cap in hand. We need to ask for. We need to do this, and we need to not be cap in hand. So, and I love that Doug introduced and Don supported the word fiasco. I think the real word that's happening to our sector uh, starts with cluster and ends with another uh, F word. It's the challenge we have is we need to be more assertive in talking about that these maps only serve the needs of commercial interests and they are used in the advertising for the broad for the uh, business architecture on top of broadband what we need to do is talk to rebalancing the maps and it needs to be directed at the fcc not the public in general and it needs to say uh the third sector stuff so exactly what you're talking about, can we say 
the maps aren't working. Can can we be more assertive with memes and lists and say we need to use these maps for the third sector? We need to have social services layered on. We need we need to have the needs of Americans. And you know, I'm from Canada, so uh, we have some of this stuff, but it's still not there. Uh, so if we were more assertive about uh, how do we direct the FCC to direct the contractor to make a third layer that uh, serves the needs of Americans? And then I would tie this to uh, the infrastructure story that talks to the economic and social infrastructure that will make uh, the uh, socioeconomic uh, world uh, fairness is not part of the conversation anymore, but it would uh, support the economic interests of helping people with employment, research, uh, uh, self-actualization, mental health, all those things that are not uh, there for especially rural, where rural areas have four times the social problems. They have four times the family violence, they have four times the suicide rate. Uh, the myth of rural life in small town being verdant uh, just isn't true. And so if we don't get this onto the maps, we are not addressing the social issues in these places where economic opportunity, social opportunity, mental health opportunity aren't there. So I'm, 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 I'm suggesting the creation of the state library agencies with a one page infographic or uh, list, listicle that uh, makes it very clear that the maps aren't meeting the needs of 100% of Americans for what for the important third sector the cultural and social sector anyway Good, that's my David. rant thank you thank you send me send me that list i'll i'll put it to the to the state agencies myself and and we'll well it, it also points out a don another issue the fcc controls the maps but the ntia controls the grants so we're, we're not even talking to one agency here to make this work for grant purposes. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunately on purpose from the Congress. The Congress did not trust giving this money to the FCC because they've shown massive ineptitude in the past with grant money. And so I'll, we I'll have, just add that maybe so our, maybe our mess, top yes. point is that the maps are politicized. And, yes. that, and that is messing them up for the yes. infrastructure need. Absolutely. It's just not news. Sorry. Uh, John, I, I feel you have something to say. Well, I, I agree with a lot of that. Uh, I will say uh, Shelby has arranged for a uh, meeting with the FCC Broadband Data Task Force tomorrow with uh, some of these state library agencies that you're referring to, Don. Um, and so we'll see. The FCC continues to assert that libraries can challenge the map and put libraries on the map. I'm skeptical because the process they've told us about would uh, is, is a convoluted one that I don't think it's really feasible for libraries to engage in. Um, but beyond the, the specific problems with the map, the other point that I think libraries uh, ought to explore is it's not just about getting broadband to the library, but through the library to the surrounding community. And we've talked about this in the past from a policy perspective, it really makes a lot of economic sense to get a big fiber cable with multiple fiber strands uh, to the library and then use those extra fiber strands um, build off of that network to reach the homes. And we know some libraries are, are beginning to do this now and it's, it's still in the early stages, but the advent of CBRS spectrum makes this much more economically feasible today than it was five years ago. Um, and the idea is to libraries could put an antenna on the roof of the library building and beam out uh, wireless broadband signals to connect to these unserved homes that could be within a mile or two mile radius of the library. And that would be an enormous public benefit 
that would provide free access. So this is sort of super Wi-Fi. So going beyond putting your Wi-Fi router in the window so you can extend the service out to the parking lot, well, that's just an incremental step. But if you could use the CBRS technology to extend that signal for a couple of miles, boy, that would connect so many more people that really need that connection. And that's, I think, another way that libraries can talk to their state representatives to say, look, we're not being selfish. It's not about just about getting us connected at the library building, but we want to use that connection to benefit the whole community. And I think there's a great public service that libraries could do to explore that technology and begin to work with a private company to, to get that deployed in a way that really serves the needs that those state broadband leaders are trying to achieve and helps to close the digital divide. Could not and there agree. are folks yeah. doing that, John. They're, they're doing that in Buffalo, New York, for example. So there's-, there's Oh, great. Yes. And, and yep, we've, I, we've won grants for the last, I don't know, six, seven years doing that very thing to and through the library with various wireless, CBRS, EBS, five gigahertz, TV white space, whatever it takes, and partnering with, with uh, private enterprise or nonprofits or, or the RENs to uh, do these solutions tailored to each community. That's the point that we've learned is that it's definitely not one size fits all. You have to mm -hmm. understand what you have in your community and work on that. The existing infrastructure, who's there, the density, topology, the trees, all of that informs a, a solution, but it's there for everybody. And so go get it. Uh, go Doug, get it. Last... Doug, yes. you got the last word. Last word? Yeah. Well, I, I would hope that you're all gonna hang up from this call subscribe to my blog and then you're going to go and contact the state broadband offices and talk to them. <laughs> all right. All right. I, I echo that. And I would also add, uh, consider joining Shelby if you're not already shelby.shlb.org, uh, a whole menu of uh, membership levels that are open to everybody and uh, tremendous value too. So thank you both, John and Doug. Really nice to have you on for the first time. We're definitely going to ask you to come back as this uh, develops and, and uh, monitor it. So I'd be that, glad to be back. Thank, thank you very much. Good to see you again, John. And with that, we will close this session 70 of Libraries in Response. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Okay.